I have a doubt that the Soviet Union was very interested in UFOs. It would not be surprising if saucers had crashed in the Soviet Union. This is so far the best footage that of an alleged uh, crash UFO or a, a dead alien that I've seen so far. Fact one. For over five decades, Western governments have been collecting information on UFOs in strict secrecy. Fact two, so did their counterparts behind the Iron Curtain. Fact three, now that the Cold War is over, the truth is finally out. The notion that life from another world may have visited our own is an intriguing one. Many say that it is true and that documentation exists to prove it, but that that proof has been kept hidden from the public for over 50 years. With the end of the Cold War has come some intriguing, if not surprising, revelations. Western governments apparently have not been the only ones gathering information on UFOs in brutal secrecy. Hello, I'm Roger Moore. Join us now as we embark on an amazing journey of discovery, of international intrigue and possible interplanetary visitation. Join us as we search for the secret of the century. of Russia is overwhelming, even to those accustomed to the wide open spaces of America. Huge tracts of eastern Russia are still uninhabited, and it was in just such a region, remote and far from civilization, that something profound happened nearly a century ago. In the desolate Tunguska region of central Siberia in 1908, something fell from the sky and exploded on the side of a hill. This event triggered an enduring mystery that scientists are still unable to adequately explain. There have been other well-known cases of UFO phenomena, but it was the Roswell incident that changed the way that government officials thought about UFOs. Researcher Paul Stonehill has done extensive work chronicling UFO sightings in the former Soviet Union. I would say that the most serious research was uh, given the impetus by Stalin in the 1940s when he found out about Roswell. It was then that the KGB and the military separately had initiated studies of UFOs. The KGB, as far as we know, had never ceased studying them. This Soviet Air Force footage was obtained by a group of Russian ufologists. It was declassified by the USSR's Ministry of Defense just before Boris Yeltsin took power. What we are looking at is a view from the cockpit camera of a MiG-23 flogger, scrambled to intercept two unknown targets. What we see now is an apparent merging of the two targets. Here is the same shot slowed down. These are obviously not typical flight characteristics of NATO, or any other conventional aircraft. The MiG lost visual contact with this object or objects, and there has never been any official identification. By attending international conferences and exchanging information over the internet, researchers on both sides of the former Iron Curtain have been able to increase the global understanding of anomalous phenomena. Richard Haynes has been to Russia many times, and has worked with many of that country's researchers. Soon after the uh, perestroika, the fall of communism, approximately 1990, 
uh, I said to myself, uh, I am. I think this is the right time to initiate uh, opening doors with the East, with people uh, on the Eastern Bloc who are sitting on their own piles of data that we don't know about it. Likewise, we're sitting on piles of data that they don't know about. And so I started corresponding with friends, and we formed this joint USA-CIS Aerial Phenomena Federation. And we're now serving uh, a, a very positive role, which is information exchange. The next clip was shot from a MiG-25 Foxbat. And what we're about to see is actually an American F-16 Falcon about 200 meters away. What happens next is that a new object appears from behind the clouds. It was not identified. The new object suddenly descends and disappears into the clouds. Once again, here is the American plane at the same altitude as the main. And now here is the object as it appears behind the F-16. And here it emerges from behind the F-16, then goes down and enters the cloud bank. As with all accounts or potential evidence of UFO encounters, researchers attempt to authenticate and verify related facts as much as possible. In general, the more spectacular the report, the more important the verification. I was intelligence officer for the Soviet military for over 30 years. My son is a pilot in the Russian Air Force now. I can say for certain that there were numerous occasions where Air Force and Navy fighter planes intercepted what we thought were NATO aircraft, only to find that they were not airplanes as we know them and not belonging to any nation on Earth. It's no secret we would send planes into their airspace, they would fly into our airspace. It's like a game, like a test, constantly trying to test the response of the other side. Only sometimes, someone would get shot at. In this case, neither the Soviets nor the Americans seem to have any clue as to what this third object is. I'm telling you, even when you blow it up, it's impossible to identify. It appears to be about four or five meters across, moves with characteristics unlike any conventional plane. Now, in this final piece of footage, we will once again be looking at a cockpit camera view, this time from a MiG-21. The camera plane and three others were scrambled to intercept an unknown craft flying at very high speed, which is visible here as a large, cylindrical-shaped object. And as the Russian planes close in, the UFO suddenly picks up speed disappears. Here it is once again. You'll notice the cylinder seems to be traveling at about the same speed as the MiGs until about here. And then it seems to increase its speed, which, according to pilots, must have reached at least Mach 3 in about 10 seconds. A lot of this footage was declassified after the Soviet military failed to identify the object seen here. This one shows an interception attempt by MiG pilots. There were many cylindrical object interceptions that were reported and investigated. We were interested in the high-speed potential of this object. The size of this one is estimated to be about twice the size of a MiG-21. With technology available to us and the Americans, it should not be able to move as fast as it does. Hey, this footage is still interesting because I don't think the Russians had any idea what they were dealing with here. Their fighters were at least as good as ours, and yet here is something that is completely beyond their capability to intercept. The acceleration rate of this thing is impossible for any aircraft that we know of. There was one tragic incident I know of occurring in the early 1970s, in which MiG-21s tried to shoot down an unknown craft flying over Western Russian airspace, which failed to respond to Soviet pilots. The pilots used standard intercept procedure to expel foreign planes out of Soviet airspace. When the craft did not respond, the pilots were ordered to lock on missiles. At that point, both jets were destroyed by some weapon not known to Soviet military. Both pilots perished. There was an effort within the Air Force to make it look as if the fighter planes collided. But investigators I knew personally at the time said it was not collision. They were shut down by something. The NSA intercepted a radio transmission that we were copied on. 
Apparently, the Russians lost a couple of MiG-21s or 23s. They were trying to intercept something unidentified. All I know is it wasn't one of ours. You know, our department received a number of stories like this involving the Soviet military and UFOs. One of the most intriguing stories we came across was first told in the new book, UFOs in the USSR, by Russian author Veniamin Grigoryevich Vereshagin. He recounts the crash of an extraterrestrial craft and subsequent recovery by Soviet officials in the late 60s. Существует свидетельство тому, что осенью 1968 года there is evidence to the fact that in the fall of 1968, there were reportedly a lot of UFO sightings in the area of Sverdlovsk, currently known as Ekaterinburg. On November 27, many residents of Berezovsky Sverdlovsk area observed several fireballs moving across the sky. One of the balls began going rapidly down, and after that, there was a loud sound of an explosion. In a few days, a Sverdlovsk paper published an article which said that the explosion had taken place on the territory of a grain storage unit due to the carelessness of some workers. But the article also mentioned that the residents of this area had witnessed similar lights before that day. This is a copy of the Sverdlovsk newspaper from November the 29th, 1968. An article on the front page entitled Beyosovsky Dreams or what was that, gives the state sanctioned account of what could have been the actual crash. Translated, the Russian copy reads, five glowing balls of light appeared over the horizon and started to move in the direction of the city. Four of the objects moved in opposite directions while the fifth began to rapidly lose altitude and soon completely disappeared behind the forest terrain. Several seconds after its disappearance, there was a deafening explosion. And in typical Soviet fashion, the paper cites the official statement. The blast had taken place at the grain storage unit number 27. The explosion was caused by one of the employees who had violated the safety code, resulting in a charge of negligence. He was sentenced to restitution of the material losses suffered by the state. What helps make the account in Bereshagin's book so compelling is the existence of several reels of film which seem to back up the story. While rumors of such film first began circulating some years ago, it was not until Bereshagin led us to the black market dealer in possession of these materials that we got our first look at what could be remarkable new evidence. If this film indeed corresponds with Bereshagin's story, what we are looking at is the scene of the crash site in Beryozovsky, as viewed by a camera on top of a military truck. The focal point of this scene is here, and indeed appears to be a disc embedded in the ground. Here we see soldiers exiting the truck, led by a captain. The troops are met by another officer, this one a major, and then they join other soldiers and officers already on the scene. This footage is one of four reels of film acquired during our investigation. The two groups that have without question been exchanging information freely are the Russian and Western ufologists. It's with a, a sense of full cooperation that much of the formerly sensitive information has surfaced. At one end of the spectrum, the simple UFO sightings, which are often accompanied by film or video footage, at the other end are accounts of actual contact with alien beings for which most bona fide researchers retain a healthy dose of skepticism. Interestingly, many psychiatrists and psychologists have placed considerably more credence in stories of alien abduction than ufologists. 
Though no such encounters have been officially reported in the former Soviet Union, and in spite of efforts by the government to deny their existence, documented cases do exist. Typically, the abductee reports seeing a blinding white light usually hovering high above. These abductees have reported under hypnosis that they feel compelled to approach the light as if they are somehow being drawn towards it. Some have reported seeing doors to the drafts actually opening for them. As with their reaction to the light, they feel compelled to walk through. Most abductees have not been able to describe the interiors of these crowds, other than recalling swirling mist and bright lights. Most reported alien abductions include harrowing accounts of medical experiments. Subjects describe an examination room of some kind. Many have reported strange probe-like tools being used on them, and they recall the frightening sensation of being examined though simultaneously being unable to do anything about it. Typically, the abductees will then find themselves back where they were when they first saw the light, having no recollection of what just happened. Other times, however, upon checking their watches, they discover that several minutes have passed without their ability to account for it. They literally have lost time. Many abductees have their memories triggered by a mark found on their bodies, the kind they would associate with a needle or some other medical instrument. And not surprisingly, no such report has ever been verified 100%. And yet these stories continue to proliferate. Are these people really being abducted by aliens or, as some now claim, by members of a secret government agency. The austere building behind me once housed what was undoubtedly the world's largest and most feared intelligence agency. Why would the KGB be so interested in what many consider to be science fiction? From the beginning of the communist era, the Soviet leaders relied on a strong secret police to act as watchdog and often executioner for their rule. This was not a new concept for Russia. During the rule of Tsar Nicholas, the secret police was everywhere, its agents spying on everyone. There were agents watching every train station, hotel, and theater. Shortly after the Russian Revolution, the first Soviet government approved the creation of their own secret police. It soon became a powerful mainstay of the Soviet system. To ensure the continuation of communist rule, the main domestic role of the secret police became to seek out counter-revolutionary views and ensure that those holding them were dealt with. After the death of Stalin in 1953, the secret police became known as the Committee for State Security, or KGB. As the Cold War heightened under Khrushchev, this was also the era that bolstered the growth of the KGB's image as an international spy agency. Foreign espionage was at its height. According to Western authorities, the KGB managed to infiltrate every major Western intelligence service. During the height of its existence, the KGB was the largest secret police and espionage force in the history of the planet, with more than 300,000 agents. Its body consisted of 17 separate units charged with such concerns as counterintelligence, foreign espionage, and internal security. The division known as the Scientific and Technical Directorate was the unit responsible for the acquisition of top secret technological information and materials, including those not originating on Earth. The government body that had the most interest in anomalous activity was very possibly the Soviet military. Did high-ranking officers of the Russian armed forces really believe they could gain a military advantage from UFOs? Though there has been much speculation on the exact nature of the Roswell incident and reports of actual alien beings, conclusive evidence of such encounters has proved elusive. In 1997, the U.S. Air Force issued a follow-up to its earlier Roswell report, which they subtitled, Case Closed. They tried to account for the stories of aliens by suggesting these were simply crash-test dummies misidentified. 
So it was with a sense of both excitement and caution that we examined the footage recently recovered in Russia. This reel contains images of what appears to be a scientific or medical examination of organic body parts. The individuals seen here appear to be forensic pathologists or biological research scientists. Speaking in Russian, they are seen inspecting the specimen, the leader of the procedure describing his actions and the measurements they are taking. After several minutes of this, there is a change in camera angles. Now we see the specimen being more extensively examined. Tools are used to cut open what the leader constantly refers to as tissue. He also describes parts that are removed as resembling various organs. The camera angle changes again. And finally, the scientists are seen posing for the camera, holding up various samples of the dissection. If this footage is authentic, it represents one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time. One must wonder where this film was shot and what happened to the specimen seen. If this is footage of a genuine scientific examination, what happened to the results? What did the Soviets learn and what have they done with that knowledge? Did agents of the KGB have reason to keep this secret for so many years? Certainly there are more questions here than answers. Russia has had countless UFO sightings. Some have been explained, some have yet to be explained. The best known events are the Darnogorsk and Tunguska incidents. Many UFO researchers feel that the most important Russian incident in terms of known crash recovered materials is the Dalnagorsk occurrence. Antonio Hermes agrees. It's uh, the best documented crash uh, because we do have the fragments. Uh, they have been analyzed. It was a small probe. It was not kind of a big object, but something crashed on a hill in Dalnagorsk in, in January of 1986. Witnesses described the object as a sphere of light streaking across the Pacific region north of Vladivostok. Investigators later recovered materials including balls of lead and iron, bits of glass and a fine mesh netting, all of which were tested and are proven to be highly enigmatic. The head of the research team concluded that the Downagost object was most likely an artificial space probe of non-terrestrial origin. Russia's best known event the Tunguska sighting is sometimes referred to as the Russian Roswell. In the early hours of June the 30th, 1908, peasants of the Tunguska River area in central Siberia watched in disbelief as a glowing round object with a fiery tail streaked across the morning sky. The object crashed in a remote region of pine forest, exploding in a brilliant ball of flame. Residual firestorm lasted for weeks and destroyed an additional 10,000 kilometers surrounding the crash point. Although the event preceded the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by nearly 40 years, the aftermath of 
at Tunguska was frighteningly similar to that of the bombings in World War II. The result was the destruction of an area larger than that of Los Angeles or Moscow. Oddly, upon investigation some 20 years later, no impact crater of any kind could be found. Researchers have formed various opinions of what actually happened. The most common beliefs are that it was a meteorite fall, a ball of lightning, or an earthquake. Many have cited that none of these answers are possible and that the phenomenon was more likely the crash of an extraterrestrial craft. It has been speculated that the governments of many countries throughout the world have been gathering information regarding UFOs. Nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman agrees. There's no question that military and intelligence groups overseas are collecting data, whether it's in Brazil or Australia or in England. So the KGB has collected information. I've talked to people who've gone to the Soviet Union who have obtained some of that information. I have met a Soviet cosmonaut and other researchers over there. There's no question they're interested. And again, the republics which used to constitute the Soviet Union cover a huge area. They, too, were monitoring the skies because they were afraid the United States was going to bomb them. So when you monitor the skies, you pick up UFOs. No question about it. During the communist reign, there was no official admission of Soviet interest in extraterrestrial activity. It has been only recently that this fact has been confirmed. The former secretary of the Commission on Anomalous Phenomena, Alexandra Petyukov, confirmed that an official state-controlled body did exist. In the context of this commission, when, in the course of her activity, she started during the Soviet era, we started to regularly collect information from the public and received more than 15,000 reports. The thing is that the commission was an official public organization. It had an official address. Today, the mindset in Russia is far different from what it was during the communist reign. On the communism, they were told that UFOs didn't exist, but the just the fact that they were told they didn't exist made, made people believe that they did exist because the government was also denying they were saying there was no crime in Russia and uh, accidents didn't happen, you know, I mean, that everything was censored and given this rosy picture, which, of course, people knew better. It was in a small house on a side street near the Academy of Medical Sciences. The British and American spies met with informants throughout the 60s and learned of one of the most bizarre plots in the world of intelligence. During my involvement for a period of at least six years, Soviet counterintelligence operatives played cat and mouse with Western agents in Moscow who were interested in our advanced technology program. Some new weapons and propulsion systems were being developed, and the CIA was using any means to get information from anyone involved with the project. Well, I was in Moscow for a year and a half. I had two other agents and a guy from the British Secret Service. We routinely debriefed two Russian informants who worked for the Ministry of Defense. We would exchange hard currency for information on new military technology. Some of this technology is definitely related to UFOs. One way we often dealt with such incursions was to feed false information through double agents to give American and British bad leads. Well, we knew the Soviets were onto something after we started getting all kinds of smokescreen intelligence. That was a sure signal that they were hiding something. It was an indication that they had recovered something near Sverdlovsk, and that they were keeping it very secret. Senior research scientist Dr. Richard F. Haynes believes the Soviets had good reason to be interested in UFOs. It's my understanding that the Soviet military has had a continuing interest in UFO phenomena for very, very many years. And the reason being that their air traffic controllers, their radar sites, their military pilots had been reporting things, just as ours had, and they had no explanation for them. And so the first uh, possible explanation would be that it's a foreign uh, nation um, test or uh, espionage or something like that of a military nature. 
And if you're in the military yourself, then you take that very seriously and you explore it. This film footage certainly seems to depict interest by Russian military personnel in the object that is seen sticking out of the ground. Soldiers, officers, and civilian clover agents are deployed around the site, and they appear to be both guarding and examining the object. This is what we found on one of the four reels of film obtained in Russia. After viewing the footage, we were able to determine that it was most likely shot with two separate cameras, one apparently a handheld camera, which starts out on the approaching truck, and a second one seen here on a tripod. As the soldiers march past, you can see the cameraman turn to follow the troops. Here we cut to the other angle, the point of view from the tripod camera. And here you see the handheld camera as the truck pulls up. Both cameras change vantage points several times during the film, as if to get better views or perhaps under orders of a superior. From this angle, we see yet more troops arrive. Author Veniamin Vereshagin describes the event. Весной же 1969 года рабочий местного совхоза In the spring of 1969, a collective farmer found some strange remains in the forest not far from Berezovsky and reported that to the local security organs, who in their turn asked the neighboring military division of air defense troops, PVO, to provide assistance with the investigation. On March 1969, two KGB officers examined the discovery site and sealed it off. On the KGB request, a Soviet Army unit was brought to the discovery site. After close examination of the place, they found some wreckage debris of a disc-shaped object partially sunk into the ground. At first, the KGB thought that the debris came from an American spy plane or a Soviet spaceship. George Feiler, a retired Air Force intelligence officer who was stationed at Langley, is not surprised the Russians were so interested in this object. We found that the Soviets would pay to get information on UFOs as opposed to, we'll say, an F-111 aircraft, but they were, in a way, more interested in UFOs than some of our latest aircraft. And here you see the man who is probably the head KGB agent directing the cameraman to point his camera toward the disc. A total of almost 1,200 feet of negative were recovered just on this crash site. It is possible that more film was shot, but this is all that we were able to obtain. None of this film depicts the removal of the disc itself, and at no point do we see inside the object. From this angle, we do see the handheld camera shooting behind or inside the disc. However, that footage, if it was in fact ever shot, was not included in the cans of film we acquired. We can only speculate that it may still be at large. We must also speculate on how the object ended up here. Based on information from Berishagin's book and what we can see in this footage, we have created this computer animated version of how researchers believe the crash may have occurred. The questions then become, where did this object come from and how did it come to crash here? And more importantly, what has happened to it since? With the change to a market economy here, many items never before available to Russians are finding their way to store shelves. Some point to this as evidence of a new prosperity. Others claim that this only fosters greed not seen during the Soviet era. They say that everything is for sale in the new Russia, including state secrets and the spies who kept them. And I'm sure that this happened because I remember in 1991, 
1992, there has been a lot of talk about the KGB files. It's quite possible that the files, some of the files, had been sold to the highest bidder. What is now modern-day Russia was once the core republic of the Soviet Union. Prior to its breakup in 1992, the USSR was the world's largest country, stretching from Eastern Europe into Asia. In addition, the USSR had direct control over the Eastern European countries of Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany. The boundary of these countries was for years referred to as the Iron Curtain. For decades, its military power influenced events throughout the globe. The single most important event in Russian history was the revolution of 1917. The Bolsheviks changed the country from a monarchy to the world's first communist state. In the late 1920s, Joseph Stalin transformed the country even more by regimenting every aspect of daily life and still managed to brutally stomp out his opposition. While the USSR was allied with the West during World War II, the years after the war ushered in an era of mistrust that came to be known as the Cold War. This new relationship chilled ever further in August of 1949 when the Soviets exploded their first atomic weapon. The Western powers, including the United States, viewed the USSR as the world's greatest threat. In its ongoing competition with the West, Russia's greatest victory occurred in 1957 under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev. It was the beginning of the space age. As the first nation into space, it's not surprising that in the years to follow, the Soviets would become increasingly curious about extraterrestrial life existing in our galaxy. Despite their early victory in the space race, back at home, the standard of living and the country's lacking economy weighed heavy on the minds of the Soviet citizens. Under Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s, the terms glasnost and perestroika came to represent a period of humanist reform. The first truly democratic elections in Russia's history occurred in 1991. After 70 years of Soviet rule, the USSR was dissolved. A new market economy has emerged along with more freedom for the people. While there are some who yearn for the return to communism, most citizens feel that the new Russian democracy has been a vast improvement to their daily lives. But with these positive changes come problems. In a recent news survey in Russia, citizens were asked the question, who controls Russia today? An astounding 23% responded the mafia. Renowned Russian writer and Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote, Russia's economic chaos is the result of nearly criminal reforms that have created a new class of mafia capitalists. The word mafia refers to the new system of organized crime in Russia involving countless government officials, businessmen, and organizations controlled by criminal groups. Resistance to extortion attempts has resulted in violence. Kidnappings, assassinations, attacks on family members, or harsh persecution by corrupt government officials have been documented. Dozens of bankers were kidnapped and assassinated by the Mafia in the first few years of Russia's independence, when organized crime was taking control over the country's financial system. Having eliminated its rivals in such a brutal manner, the Russian Mafia is now in a position of great power. What the future holds for the Russian Republic is uncertain. What is certain is that in the next Russian elections in the year 2000, the interests of big business and those with money will be well represented, and undoubtedly so will organized crime. Mafiocracy, as it has been called, might become the totalitarianism of the new millennium. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, many changes have come to Moscow and the rest of Russia. Gone is communism and the strict controls that once governed daily life here. Please understand, Russia has always uh, been a secret society. Just recently, we found out that uh, the uh, secret police had kept records on a UFO phenomena and some of them had been released only recently. Some, not all, coming to light now. 
Case in point, the intriguing film footage we had acquired. Proof, some say, of alien visitation. Being that this material is of such sensational nature, we had many questions regarding its history. Little information was provided us by the black market dealer from whom the film was purchased. It is likely that such materials were kept stored in a holding facility, a vault located beneath KGB headquarters, perhaps, reserved only for those with the highest level of security clearance. Kept safe in underground storage for decades, the film was probably only handled by a select few who would have known of its existence. After the collapse of the Soviet system, there was a transitional period marked by confusion. Accountability to the old regime dwindled and closely guarded property lay vulnerable to the changes sweeping through the Kremlin Union. Those with connections under the old regime found themselves perfectly positioned to exploit the situation. There was a lot of chaos when the Soviet Union you know, disintegrated. In my opinion, at that time, it was very easy for an you know, agent uh, with brains to get his hands on, on such files and sell them here. So it would be conceivable that documentation might be obtainable through similar sources to provide authentication of the film. Though most leads proved to be ultimately unproductive, we found that with perseverance, money, and a bit of luck, it is possible to acquire classified Soviet documents. Using a hidden camera, we recorded numerous meetings over a period of months in which we attempted to obtain relevant materials. This transaction between one of our Moscow contacts, an interpreter, and a local black market dealer proved to be one of the more successful ventures. The location of this meeting is a textile factory in the Sokolniki district of Moscow. This office is that of the Russian entrepreneur who owns the plant and is used for both legitimate and illegal business. After introductions and some initial small talk, the American buyer asks the interpreter if the documents are on the premises. Are the documents here the A businessman tells him that he has had difficulty in obtaining the documents and the price has gone up. 